It's fair to say, Cajon Pass had seen some tragic freak accidents in the past, in 1989 and 1994, so locals wondered, could it get worse? Well, unfortunately, it would get worse. On February 1st, 1996, at 1 a.m., Santa Fe train HBALT1-31 departed Barstow Yard in California. The train consisted of GP60M157, GP50-3853, GP60B342, and GP60-4031. The train was a manifest, carrying all sorts of cargo like general merchandise, iron coils, lumber, plastic pellets, tires, pipes, fillerboard, and hazardous materials like pesticides in seven tanker cars. Like the ill-fated trains that crashed before it, this crew had no idea they were headed for trouble. The engineer tested his brakes at Victorville, California, coming to a stop. This was comply with the timetable instruction, requiring him to make an air brake test at the location. The brakes worked fine, so he continued on. Then the train stops again at Summit, California to wait for a signal. Once again, the brakes worked. After being cleared at 3.40 a.m., they descended toward Cajon Pass. As they began to go down, the engineer initiates the dynamic brakes on 157, but instead of slowing the train down, the train instead accelerates. The engineer then hits the air brakes into full emergency, but to his horror, the speedometer ominously creeped up to 45 miles an hour. There was nothing more the crew could do to save their train. The conductor and the brakeman bail out from 157, but the engineer stayed with his locomotives like a captain of a sinking ship, hoping to ride it out. In a last-ditch effort, he throws the engines into reverse, but then he felt 157 start to lean to the right on a sharp curve by a trestle bridge. He ducked to the floor and braced for the inevitable. train jumps the tracks and flies into a dry creek bed. 157 skidded onto its right side mostly intact, while the other engines ended up crushed by 45 of the 49 freight cars derailing and smashing into one another. The tanker cars exploded and the wreckage became an inferno. Like the engineer of 7551 East seven years ago, the engineer climbs out of the damaged lead engine, which remained relatively intact from the rest of the train. Two locals who heard the roar of the crash came to help the badly injured engineer. The conductor, however, jumped the wrong way and smashed his head into a rock, killing him instantly. The brakeman survived from jumping the train, but later died from carbon monoxide poisoning from the fire. As the fire burns, toxic smoke rises into the air that can be seen for miles. As a precaution, Interstate 15 near the wreck is shut down while firefighters battled the flames and locals near the area are ordered to evacuate. Because of the chemicals, firefighters had to be hosed down after exposure to the fumes. Hours passed and eventually one tank car containing the flammable liquid butyl acrylic was found to have its internal temperature rising from the heat creating the risk of a blevy or boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion, which occurs when there's a rupture of a vessel containing a pressurized liquid that's reached a temperature way beyond its boiling point. Finally, on February 5th at 9.44 p.m., the car was ventilated by using plastic explosives and was no longer a threat. Therefore, Interstate 15 and California State Route 138 were reopened at 11.47 p.m.
The National Transportation Safety Board concluded that the probable cause was the same reason why the Santa Fe Intermodal ran away and collided with the UP coal train in 1994, a kink in the air hose that triggers the brakes. Train brakes work differently than other air brakes. Brakes apply when pressure drops instead of increasing. To, incre to keep the brakes off, air brakes should be charged to 90 psi, while 0 psi is for emergency. The psi meter was however only showing 81 psi when the engineer applied the brakes instead of 90 psi like it should. A crimp or kink in the air hose could block or restrict the amount of air flowing through the air brakes. Such a crimp or kink will generally occur in a worn or damaged hose or in a hose connected to an unauthorized design or repair. As HBALT 1-31 began its descent, the slack and the train couplers and draft gear bunched together. The slack action may have bent the air hose and pinched off the airflow for the engines to the rear of the train and resulted in the loss of air brakes. It was suspected that the 16th car was the culprit, as it was added before the train left and improper repairs were done to its air hose. However, considering how far back the car was, it was likely it had little to no impact on the train. The NTSB then shifted their attention to the 5th car. It was within the affected position for a blockage, as identified by the simulation for the crash. However, the derailment, subsequent fire, and the wreckage prevented close examination of the car. Repair records showed no history of intermittent problems indicative of hose kinking or restriction. The investigators were also unable to find any brake hoses that appeared to have been kinked or crimped before the accident or that could have been identified to any particular car in the suspect zone between 5 and 8. Whatever the case, the NTSB concluded that somewhere between car number 5 and car number 9, an air hose kinked, cutting off the train's brakes. In the end, 3853 and 4031 were damaged beyond repair and scrapped. 157 and 342 were repaired and put back into service, still operating today with BNSF. 23 years had passed since the incident. A memorial to the two crew members that died was erected by the crash site. A chilling reminder of not just the 1996 crash, but the other two that happened years before. Since then, no more trains have run away down the grade, and now safety systems are in place for where when a train's air brake pressure drops too much from a kink or a leak, emergency brakes are applied automatically stopping the train. But locals can't stop wondering, have they seen the last runaway train? <laughs>